And it's time to start the webinar. Good evening, India. Good afternoon, Europe. Good morning, Canada and the United States. Welcome all to the second day of the, or to the first day of the second webinar organized by ISCLER on the one hand, uh, the International Society for Contemporary Legend Research and departments of the Mahatma Gandhi University. My name is Theo Meder. Uh, I'm a folk narrative researcher at the Meertens Institute in Amsterdam and a professor at the University of Groningen in the Netherlands. Um, apart from that, I am president of ISCLER uh, at the moment. And this year I started organizing webinars like these. So, um, this is the first day. Uh, it looks very, very um, promising and exciting. And remember, this was all organized in just a month or so. Uh, and the result is remarkable, thanks to, among others, uh, Anoop and Matthew. So um, there is there are other moderators for today. And I suppose I better give now the microphone to Matthew. Uh, I hope I'm uh, audible. Anup. Uh, Madam, can yes. I start? Yes, please. Yes. Can you start? Yes. yes. Good day to all. Welcome to the second ISCLR webinar on contemporary legends and pandemic law conducted in association with Sri Shankara Vidya College and Center for Urban Studies, Mahatma Gandhi University, Kerala, India. The moderators of today's session are Dr. Matthew Evarge and Abhinand Kishore. I cordially invite Dr. Matthew and Abhinand Kishore on behalf of the thank webinar you, uh, team. Thank you, thank you. And uh, uh, very happy to see uh, this going. And uh, thank you, uh, uh, Theo, Theo, for uh, uh, the curtain raiser. And uh, we are, uh, as mentioned, entering into uh, the second ISELR webinar, uh, this time in association with uh, Sri Shankara Vidya Bhidam College and Center for Urban Studies. And uh, in many ways, it's a, it's a coming together of a, of a promising dialogue as uh, we've been witnessing in the organizing phase. Uh, I hope I'm audible, right? Yes. 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 And uh, uh, so we are starting the proceedings today with uh, the introductory lecture uh, by uh, Professor Rajan Gurukul, uh, who is currently the vice chairman of Kerala State Higher Education Council. And we have invited him to give the introductory lecture today. And he needs no introductions to the scholarly and academic community in this region. But for those in our collective who have joined from different parts of the world, welcome to you all. Uh, Professor Gurukul, uh, has been uh, one of the pioneering uh, persons to work on the social formations of early South India. And uh, among many other things, he has written and published uh, widely on uh, socioeconomic cultural history of Kerala, structural anthropology, human ecology, uh, social formations and uh, temple formations. And uh, uh, recently he has uh, uh, made very interesting contributions into science studies, as well as we, and we really note the 2018 work, History and Theory of Knowledge Production, that has come out, that was 2018. Um, and with uh, much happiness, uh, we invite uh, Professor Gurukal uh, to give the introductory lecture today in this uh, second webinar. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Matthew and all distinguished scholars from different parts of the country as well as the world. Uh, my topic, as already notified, is fantasizing the pandemic between a new world and apocalypse. 
kind of fear of apocalypse or the imminent end of the world has been integral to the collective unconscious, a segment of the deepest layer of the mind genetically inherited by all human beings, which accounts for deep-seated beliefs and instincts as uh, psychoanalyst Carl Jung maintained. Humans have always been suffering from the deep-seated fear about survival threats ensuing from nature as well as culture. From time immemorial, people have been taking huge floods or acute resource scarcity or pandemic diseases as horrifying signs of apocalypse. All major teleological myths talk about apocalypse and the legendary heralding of the post-apocalyptic uh, ap uh, phase or uh, apocalyptic uh, post-apocalyptic society. It is a temporal overview of the imageries, utopian and dystopian, which I want to present through a few examples. You know, cultures everywhere in the world have parables about human origins and ends as lineal or cyclical phenomena. Mesopotamian myths of flood date the oldest. It occurs in the flood myth of Noah in the Old Testament and the Indian myth of Manu. Flood myths in all cultures narrate the origins and ends of humans. The Mesopotamian origin myth talks about uh, humans as creation by lower gods for sharing the hard jobs imposed uh, upon them by higher gods. Humans proliferated fast, using up the earth's resources. Hence, a higher god sent floods to destroy the humans. I mean, that's the Mesopotamian myth. Soon he realized the need for human population and allowed it to exist for shorter lifetime, regulated by battles, bees, and diseases. That's how the Mesopotamian myth <coughs> goes. Uh, humans continue generating parables of the end of the world through their description of the end uh, is a, a varied imaginaries. They imagine the destruction of the life on earth by a meteorite hitting the planet or a thick cloud of dust hiding the sun or huge volcanic eruptions or massive tectonic movements causing earthquakes, avalanches and floods or a pandemic disease or an extraterrestrial war or a holocaust killing the people. Operation of pandemic diseases like smallpox, plague, pestilence, cholera and flu has been viewed apocalyptic in the past, going back many years. A compelling set of post-apocalyptic motives to imagine new challenges is there in many works. Many post-apocalyptic writings portray a society of great suffering due to injustice. Many are utopian, utopian imagination of alternative ways of living outside of capitalism uh, has come up strongly in recent times in various writings. Heralding a new phase in the post-apocalyptic uh, literature. Post-apocalyptic landscapes are made up of the coexistence of utopian mythscapes and dystopian mythscapes in the old and contemporary literature. Now, Gunther Anders, a German philosopher, journalist, and poet who lived between 1902 and 1992, famed by books like The Outdatedness of Human Beings, 
volume one on the soul in the era of the second industrial revolution published in 1956 and volume two on the destruction of life in the era of the third industrial revolution argues apocalypse real and utopian imaginaries mere blind optimism pandemic diseases are viewed as the curse of displeased deities and the allusions in the old testament homer's iliad and sophocles oedipus the king rational thoughts always countered the view but it's a fact even today that you have all over the world uh, deities and de deities for every virus that created a big uh, havoc all over the world. You have uh, smallpox goddesses in different states of India. In, in Kerala, smallpox goddess is still a very powerful deity. And every year, this deity is being propitiated through various rituals. And uh, particularly in northern part of Kerala, you have numerous temples where smallpox goddess Vasuri Mala Tamburati is uh, deified. <coughs> the, uh, or the practice continues. I will not be surprised to find out that COVID-19 virus has a goddess consecrated somewhere. Anyway, going back to the old writings, see, Thucydides, who lived between circa 460 and 395 BCE, uh, writes in his history of the Peloponnesian War uh, various things, interesting things about the, the pandemic. And the Latin poet Lucretius, who lived between uh, circa 99 and 55 BCE, in his De Rerum Natura, uh, rejects the belief that epidemics were God's punitive measure against sin, saying that diseases do not dis disparage the evil from the good or the selfish. Uh, and the averages. The 14th century writings such as Boccaccio's The Decameron and Chaucer's The Canterbury Tales see the fear of contagion to have increased significantly. The average selfishness, greed, and, and corruption adding to death and moral decay. Denial uh, of the altruistic values uh, is noted with a lot of significance. So you find a very rational approach to the causality of the pandemic in uh, the, the classical Greek writings. Daniel Defoe of the later period, who lived between 1659-1731, uh, adopts a rational approach in his detailed description and statistical account of the Great Plague of London during 1665 in his work called A Journal of the Plague Year. Likewise, the novels of the Italian novelist Alessandro Manzoni, who lived between 1785 and 1873, the betrothed and history of the column of infamy provide a rational description of the plague that ravaged Milan in the 17th century. In English, The Last Man, published in 1826 by Mary Shelley, 
who lived between 1797 and 1851, is one of the first apocalyptic novels, a futuristic narration of the world that had undergone a massive uh, devastation by a plague. She is quite rational in speaking about the few who survived as persons of immunity and those abstaining from contacts with the infected. Similarly, Edgar Allan Poe, the famous American poet and novelist, wrote a short story, The Mask of the Red Death, distinct for its use of the name plague as a metaphor to describe not the plague causing people's death, but the death plaguing the people. Now, Jack London, who lived between 1876 and 1916, a US writer, journalist, and activist in the Socialist Party of America, an enemy of capitalism, obviously, and a vehement critic of international wars, was known for his novels like The Call of the Three and White Fang, published in 1906. The Unparalleled Invasion, published in 1910. The Scarlet Plague, published in 1912. Uh, all these novels uh, can be called uh, partly scientific fictions because there is very sharp contemporary consciousness uh, uh, very intimately related to the scientific understanding. And uh, London's narrative style is also uh, in, um, uh, in, a, in, a, in a structure uh, that is common to scientific fictions. Now, the Scarlet Plague is one of the earliest examples of a post-apocalyptic novel that fabricates a futuristic narrative of life in 2073. This was uh, published in um, 1912, but it imagines the future society uh, very interestingly dated precisely to 2073. That is 60 years after the spread of the Red Death, that is bubonic plague, an uncontrollable epidemic that almost entirely destroyed the world in 2013. That's what he imagines. It is in the form of a narration of the tragic story of the epidemic devastation to his grandsons by one James Howard Smith alias Gransner, who survived along with a few. Although written a century ago, it's very much a problem of distress even today. Many of his stories are fabricated around the pandemics and infectious diseases, more in the diction of scientific fictions. His earlier writings reflect contemporary scientific discoveries on pathogens by scientists such as Louis Pasteur, who lived um, between 1822 and 1895, and uh, Robert Koch, who lived between 1843 and 1910. London's The Unparalleled Invasion, published in 1910, is about an imagined biological warfare of the United States and the Western countries to protect European colonies in Asia from the Chinese immigrants by checking China's population growth, all imaginary. In the Scarlet Plague, London goes historical about the ethics driven uh, to traditional literary approaches to plague, 
before analyzing the clinical presentations of the disease, not in scientific terms, but more in sociological and emotional or psychological terms. He analyzes the aspects of pandemic phobia, irrationally and average triggered by mysterious nature of the universe of microorganisms. He shows the people's initial uh, response to the microbial diseases, uh, which was based on confidence in science. But in 21st century, in his imagination, uh, scientific temper was waning. In the wake of the contagion spread in amazing speed and suddenness in causing death, making people flee frantically from places uh, in, in panic. And people knew about science, about biotechnology of the 20th century. Uh, people knew a lot of microbiology, but at the same time, presenting an altogether different with its spread in amazing speed and then death to the people uh, with an unpredictable duration, sometimes even sudden death. All these made people panic and then they started fleeing from the place where they heard the news about people infected. So finally, this chaotic situation brings the civilization to an end. That's what he narrates. According to London, ultimately, capitalism has to be blamed for the spread of plague, for it happened due to the crowd created by population growth, which accounted for the rise of capitalism. Now the, the novel, Scarlet Plague anticipated the Spanish flu of 1918-1920 in an unbelievable uh, manner or with unbelievable kind of accuracy, which took the life of 50, 50 million people, according to some accounts, and in various accounts, 20 million people. But anyway, a, a very significant number the Spanish flu claimed during 1918-1920 period uh, lives far more than what the First World War claimed. Its predictive power, that is London's predictive power, surprises us not only in terms of the magnitude of the pandemic that he portrays, but also the consequential health crisis, the details of the crisis, and then uh, the various social aspects like people's behavior, responses, and then, then the state's attitude, state's actions, and the widely shared fear of apocalyptic dimension. Now, all these he goes into details and that is really unbelievable. A person writing work uh, during 2010 and publishing it in 2000, uh, uh, no, no, uh, writing it in 19, 1910 and publishing it in 1912. Imagining uh, Spanish flu, He's, he was not calling it Spanish flu, but uh, the Scarlet Plague, according to him, but soon people that's after six years, people witnessed the anticipated ravage by uh, a virus. Uh, similarly, the various manifestations during the, the pandemic, how uh, people behaved, how the state behaved and, and so on. Now like that you have several works, I am uh, not able to 
read out all the works uh, due to my ignorance but some of the chosen ones specifically relating to the theme that i am trying to put across uh, the next one can be pale horse pale rider uh, published in 1939 uh, work authored by catherine and porter so this is another book that is equal or more contemporary relevance you know, i'm i'm making a comparison between the scarlet plague by london and and then catherine and porter's work porter's pale horse pale rider is fabricated around the spanish flu it's real it is inspired by spanish flu and the first world war it tells the story of a young woman falling in love with a soldier the spanish flu of 1918 that killed about uh, 20 million people while the world war put to death only around 10 million people now here the novel really goes into the unseen consequences of both consequences of the pandemic were far more lasting than those of the war ironically the dramatic global impact of the flu was overshadowed by the even more dramatic events of the war in fact the novelist experienced the flu as a patient herself witnessing the massive depopulation of the city that gave a new world uh, to her after she was back to health a uh, similarly a work very well known work published in 1947 albert camus the plague uh, as bivits a novel with the archetypal title the plague there are multiple ways one can interpret camus 1947 work first as a metaphor for the horrors of fascism and second as an allusion to a cholera epidemic in algeria that broke out in 1849 camus the plague is uh, around the events in a, in in the city of oran in algeria which was shut down for months let us say lockdown put under lockdown as the plague uh was dis disseminating uh or killing the city population also abounds with parallels to today's crisis local leaders are reluctant at first to acknowledge the early signs of the plague dying rats jittering the streets the books narrator dr bernard rux reflects the quiet heroism of the medical workers we also have witnessed this uh, although some very rude and people with bizarre uh, thoughts attacked doctors and other medical staff the large uh, larger population really respected them and uh, internalized the values and passions of healthcare embodied in, in them for the moment um, we uh, are really inspired by the uh, this the dialogue of the doctor uh, a doctor in the novel dr bernard rucks he says there are sick people and they need curing i am not afraid of the disease i do not know i have no time to think about it in the end i understand there is only one thing that remains that is human love 
Now, uh, what I would like to say is that all these works, especially the Scarlet Plague, uh, paved the way for other literary works like uh, George R. Stewart's Earth, Earth Abides, published in 1949. I Am Legend by Richard Mason, published in 1954. And The Standby, um, uh, Stephen King, published in 1978. The Stand was uh, uh, written somewhere around 1750s, and then uh, it was published finally in 1978. Uh, Michael Christian's The Andromedia Strain, published in 1969, deals with a group of scientists uh, and um, an epidemic caused by extraterrestrial microorganism. And now uh, there is a very strong view that virus really comes from space and uh, virus falls down and then nocturnal animals, particularly fruit bats and uh, various other animals catch virus. They re they remain on the on the wings and and the uh, the skin and so on of these nocturnal animals. And when a human contact becomes frequent with these animals, the virus uh, establishes. Uh, a zoonotic link with the human beings and then uh, identifies a receptor in human beings and then finally it becomes a human disease as well. But how this communication takes place and there are various imaginary writings but mostly uh, relating the virus as divine agents sent by gods to punish the sinuous people and so on. But now there is uh, a different kind of knowledge in virology about the uh, ability of a virus. Now it's very interesting because virus doesn't even have <coughs> DNA, it is just RNA. But RNA has consciousness, it has its own knowledge base, its interpretation center, it takes decisions. It knows how to establish relationships, links and so on. For example, COVID-19 uh, virus has a very interesting receptor in human beings. It is called angiotensin converter enzyme 2. How does this virus identify angiotensin converter enzyme 2 as the receptor? And then how does it recognize the receptor? And uh, how does it know that it should reach aviol for negotiating a relation with the DNA there and enable itself self-replication. So all these are not accidental. Whatever you say, there is communication. It's not just a, a dismissive statement that it is <clears throat> a chemical communication. It's, it's um, a cyto semiotic communication. Whatever it is, it is communication. There is a recognition there is interpretation, there is action. All this is done by RNA as a parasite on a cell, very cleverly using the DNA over there. Anyway, there are interesting 
novels written uh, in this milieu of virology particle chemistry particle physics and so on uh, similarly there are various interesting writings uh, sometimes expressing the discontentment and protest of uh, people against the existing conditions as women responding very creatively to various situations one is not able to see the rebellious nature in it because it is a very gentle kind of reaction but some are direct critical approaches and some are even vindictive as well for example um, one novel is around an epidemic created by a virus but that virus is anti men that virus will kill only men and women are not infected at all so they are having their wish fulfillment through uh, a semi apocalyptic operation of pandemic uh, similarly there are anti capitalist uh, talking about the pandemics destroying the uh, people who tease frustrate and exploit the marginalized people and the proletariats anyway the stand by stephen king published in 1978 is an interesting novel because it combines uh, aeronautics with biotechnology the stand is actually an artificial planet created by the modern space technologies uh, it's called a planet but we know that in existing aeronautics creation of a platform is quite common we have several platforms in the space now many space technologies go and stay there even for 6 months and then come back and uh, countries rich countries are thinking about uh, taking tourists over there so space trips of tourists and so on so that is uh, already a real thing now stephen king is talking about a planet called this stand that provides a station for the humanity uh, straining at the least to get out of a space of destruction space of devastation by a virus named captain trips captain trips is only uh, a virus but quite nightmarish because of its its capacity to deracinate the population uh, it's an interesting book with transgressive power as horror writer grady hendrix observed you can feel the great relish king uh it took in burning it all down in the stand now another interesting work published in 1985 written by gabriel garcia marquez you all know love in the time of cholera plagues are like imponderable dangers that surprise people Marcus told the New York Times in 1988 they seem to have a quality of destiny 
in the same interview he spoke of his fondness for daniel defos a journal of the plague year and how it was one of the inspirations for this decade spanning tale of star crossed lovers where death is never far from the reader's mind doubtless you have heard a variation on the title of this classic love story from marcus originally published in 1985 the book tells the tale of two star crossed young lovers whose relationship runs into trouble when the woman marries a prominent doctor fighting to stop cholera but nothing can stop florento from pursuing uh, fermina and he does until she is a widow hoping he will give her another chance cholera functions as a backdrop and a metaphor for so many things in this poetic novel and one of the main characters is a physician trying to battle the illness years later the couple find each other again will they take another chance on love the beautiful language of emotional story of this a heartbreaking novel resonates even more right now now the journey of plague years uh, as spinard uh, published in 1988 uh, is a, a novel of political urgency to much of uh, see uh, of the countries of the time particularly in europe uh, as spinard's science fiction is very well known now he uses the resources of writing science fiction for doing this work as well although the a uh, title is very well known but he purposely uses that the novel uses a widespread outbreak of a constantly mutating virus to critique conservative responses to hiv and aids in the 1980s for 20 years sex and death were inexorably intertwined uh as spinard's book uh, is quite well known in in various ways and it's in its prescience its predictive power is also uh, a well acknowledged attribute now the child garden by gof raiman published in 1989 uh sprawling thought provoking uh the novel deals with a futuristic society in which viruses are used as a tool to benefit and educate humans it's a very interesting novel uh, and uh, one has to relate it to a scientific fiction because uh, raiman uh, writes like a scientist it's a novel in which concepts of sickness health and mortality itself are turned on their heads it is also reflective of rainman's approach to fiction in a 2006 interview rainman said stories make us really sick neuroses and psychoses are just stories we tell ourselves and believe now ammonite another interesting novel written by nicola griffith published in 1992 griffith's award winning novel uses a futuristic epidemic to address questions of gender and society it is set in the future on a planet where a virus has had a significant impact on the travelers sent by earth to explore the alien universe given that she is based in king country washington griffith has been offering 
first hand commentary and analysis of covid 19 beauty salon by mario bellatin published in 1994 uh, bellatin says that uh, It was a theme that the author was constantly dwelling upon. Uh, set in a world devastated by a pandemic affecting only men. That is the interesting theme. This I just now mentioned is an, one of the examples. There are a few such novels. Uh, Bellatin's novel uh, is a, a very interesting uh, satire-like novel, but it's very serious about talking the gender sensitivity of the virus or gender discrimination of virus, better to say. The novel's narrator runs a beauty salon, which becomes a hospice for those afflicted. In a words, um, without uh, borders that is that was published in 2010 maggie riggs observed that what the narrator has given to them and the latin to us is a model for dying and for living so the uh, in in uh, the the novel called words without borders uh, we find a mixture of the uh, practice of disparaging uh, women with patriarchal prejudices and certain high ethical postulates. Uh, similarly, Jose Saramago uh, wrote Blindness in 1995. This is a Nobel Prize winning work by Saramago. Blindness, a growing number of people within a city find themselves unable to see suddenly. This is the result of a, a virus driven pandemic. The government's response is heavily handed is heavy handed and authoritarian saramago followed it up years later with another novel seeing which dealt with some of the same themes in a very different way an absolute plague literature classic and one of the best books about pandemics blindness invents a, a, a world where an epidemic sweeps the globe, robbing its victims of the crucial sense of sight. So a person realizes that he is infected by, by finding himself blind. Now, this is, uh, this is um, really unbelievable. But today, when we talk about the consequence of COVID-19, that you lose this, I mean, you lose your taste and you lose your ability to smell. You cannot sniff, you cannot taste. So in that sense, there is nothing unlikely uh, about the, the characteristic feature of the virus infection that Saramago uh, has been dealing with in blindness. As chaos and criminal activity reign, the one person spared uses their eyesight to help lead people out of terror and into a better place. Now, the Years of Rice and Salt by Kim Stanley Robinson, published in 2002, uh, is another interesting novel actually going back to 14th century to uh, talk about 
a situation in apocalyptic perception. The theme is bubonic plague killing millions of people in Europe. Robinson's alternate history, the years of rice and salt is set in a world that one character describes as a mutation of the plague, so strong it killed off all its hosts and therefore died itself. This, this is an imagined microbiological reality. We generally as a matter of consolation used to say that no virus will go beyond a point. It wouldn't be 100% destructive because its host would disappear. Disappearance of host would mean self-disappearance. The virus itself would phase out. Therefore, virus has its own built-in mechanism to recognize all these things. And therefore, when it fixes the conditions of contract with the host, the elimination of the host is excluded. Now, all of which is to say that Europe is largely empty for centuries in the world of this novel, causing a very different balance of global power to emerge. That is the politics of it. So you find the writers uh, uh, using their imaginary uh, relations in mind, enabled by knowledge and also political consciousness, linking up the operation of the virus or the pandemics and so on with uh, the mission of uh, removing social contradictions, removing relationships of exploitation, removing patriarchal biases, removing superstitions and so on. So all that an enlightened person uh, finds fault, fault uh, with the existing society uh, is removed uh, in a fictitious manner. But there is science about it. Or using knowledge is always there in any novel. But the interesting thing is that in these novels dealing with virus and pandemics and so on, you find a lot of scientific knowledge base in uh, structuring the knowledge or organizing the theme. Uh, Oryx and Cakes, Oryx and Craigs by Margaret Atwood, published in 2003. Uh, is another very interesting work. The first volume in her near future Mad Adam trilogy describes a world devastated by the effects of genetic engineering, including a plague that has wiped out much of humanity. As there's a lot of awareness about the uh, kind of biotechnological research in, in progress uh, in the initial decades of the uh, initial decade of the 20, uh, 20th century. As with much of Atwood's speculative fiction, it feels uh, early prescient, highly predictive regarding events that took place after its 2003 publication. A cautionary tale about the unexpected and terrible places technology could take us all. That is the most important aspect. Although many people do not know the level of science, the language of narration is such that the reader gets educated in the science base or the knowledge base of the novel. Now, various writings came up making use of science on the one side, but with lot of phobia around uh, doomsday, lot of phobia around apocalypse works 
regarding SARS of 2002, MERS of 2012, Ebola of 2014, now they all have uh, they all have inspired uh, uh, people with uh, new knowledge and insights. Margaret Atwood's *The Year of the Flood*, published in 2009, shows us a post-pandemic world with the humans nearly extinct. You you find zombies around. Most of the population wiped out uh, in 25 years by the waterless flood, a virulent plague that traveled through the air as if on wings. It burned through cities like fire. Atwood captures the extreme isolation felt by the, the uh, few survivors. Toby, a gardener, scans the horizon from her substance, subsistence a rooftop, uh, uh, vegetable garden in a, a deserted spot. There must be someone else left. She can't be the only one on the planet. There must be others, but friends or foes? One doesn't know. If she sees one, how to tell? Ren wants a, a, a trap says, a dancer, one of the cleanest dirty girls in town, is alive because she was in quarantine for a possible client transmitted disease. She writes her name over and over. You can forget who you are if you are alone too much. Through flashbacks, Atwood elaborates on how the balance between the natural and the human worlds was destroyed by bioengineering sponsored by the ruling corporations and how activists like Toby taught back. Always alert to the downside of science, Atwood bases her work on all too plausible premises, making the year of the flood terrifying prescient. What makes pandemic fiction so engaging is that humans are joined together in the fight against an enemy that is not a human enemy. There are no good guys or bad guys. The situation is more nuanced. Each character has an equal chance to survive or not. The range of individual responses to dire circumstances makes intriguing a uh, grist for the novelist and the reader. Children's Hospital by Chris Adrian, published in 2006, uh, is also like this. It, uh, this is Adrian's um, uh, a twist with uh, the medical field, uh, his own career in medicine alongside the mythological. In his second novel, The Children's Hospital, a plague called the Boch emerges after a series of events, some apocalyptic, some miraculous. Anyway, some of these novels owed their insights to the worldwide experience of major virus epidemics like severe and acute respiratory syndrome, SARS of 2003, as well as the potential for a resurgence of anthrax and smallpox, the spread of avian flu A NHN1 in 2005-2006 and influenza A H1N1 in 2009. Besides films like 12 Monkeys by Terry Gilliam, uh, released in 1995, 28 Days Later by Danny Boyle, released in 2002, Carriers by Alex Poster, David Poster, released in 2009, and Contagion by Steven Soderbergh, 
in 2000, released in 2011, owe their themes to the actual contagions of the time. Now, the transmigration of bodies by Yuri Herrera, published in 2013, is often set near the border between the United States and Mexico. The transmigration of bodies follows a familiar Noel scenario. Two crime families at war in a single town during the after effects of a deadly plague. Uh, Station 11 by Emily St. John Mandel, published in 2014, uh, is set in the wake of a devastating strain of the flu, which kills 99% of humanity. The book's structure juxtaposes scenes of survivors of the epidemic with sudden end of the world as we know, as the Gorgian um, flu wreaks havoc. Mandel's story is an ultimately hopeful one focusing on the ways art endures. If the world was as lush and dreamy as Emily St. John Mandel's Station 11, maybe nobody would mind risky pandemics. In this critically acclaimed novel, Mandel has built an intricate world where a band of actors roam a post-pandemic dystopian reality. Station 11 offers a vital perspective of how art fundamentally matters to civilization. You see, these are all um, really helpless cries representing the repressed fields, repressed areas in the wake of the flourishing uh, uh, a flourishing latest phase of capitalism called techno-capitalism. Find Me by Laura Vandenberg, published in 2015, uh, likewise is set against the backdrop of an epidemic that erases the memories of those infected. So they become El uh, they become Alzheimer's or they lose their identity because they do not know themselves. They do not know their history and therefore they are uh, quite meaningless in existence. So that's another interesting novel uh, focusing on a, a special symptom of the disease. The person becomes amnesiac. Uh, Severance by Lingma, published in 2018, describes an imaginary epidemic that taps into anxieties about both the pandemics and nostalgia. The author describes it as an apocalyptic novel with an immigrant backstory narrated by uh, Candace Jen, a millennia, millennial who works at a Bible publishing firm. She is one of nine survivors who flee New York City during the fictitious 2010 Shen fever pandemic. That is the name of the virus. Uh, this is it. Excuse me, sir. Yes. Uh, sorry, sorry for inter sorry for the interruption. Actually, our next session is scheduled to start from. I'm, I'm, I'm right. Oh, okay, 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 okay. Thanks. I'm writing up. All these novels are amazingly contemporaneous to the context of COVID 19 pandemic and in every aspect of what the world experiences today. Uh, Angela Becker Widergaard's doctoral study in comparative literature, fictions of destruction, post 1945 narrative and disaster in the collective imaginary is an excellent exposition examining massive disaster stories in the book. Now coming to the other side. Now I just want to mention one name. Most of the works are post-apocalyptic contemplations with a kind of primordial phase deprived of the material culture of the civilized, for, uh, civilized foregone world. But you have some philosophical works which are completely optimistic. 
there are post apocalyptic imaginaries imaginaries of the ideal world which is the new world several social theoretical writings uh, celebrate the emergence or celebrate as if there has taken place the emergence of the ideal new world for most for most among them is slavoj's effect uh, uh, who uh, authored pandemic covid 19 shakes the world that speculates the formation of span uh, a formation of pan world communism of a different kind now i i don't want to explain it here i don't have time either the idea is that revolution failed to globalize communism but virus has succeeded in it according to slavoj sisek thank you thank you uh, thank you professor bunkar uh, for uh, initiating the procedures uh, today with uh, that uh, uh, grand frame of uh, works that has uh, uh, interrogated the pandemic and uh, the associated uh, fictional representations as well as uh, the larger context that you brought in um, unfortunately our sessions are about to start at uh, nine o'clock so, the time of discussion as well <laughs> so uh so this is we have uh, queries which are we are taking we are recording and uh, this uh, will be uh, uh, um, sent to you subsequently and uh, um, with uh, uh, great pleasure on behalf of all the three organizing bodies uh, we uh, thank you and we uh, get immediately into the uh, the sessions uh, for today.